all, this is Dr. Mubin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So we have discussed about the Epstein-Barr virus and the long COVID before as well. Actually, I believe four videos. So my request is that if you can find those videos on my channel and watch them, these will be very useful as well. Today, what I wanted to do was look at a bigger um, number of studies and present to you the definitive, I think it is definitive, evidence that Epstein-Barr virus in some people have a role in their long COVID or vaccine injury symptoms. Secondly, I wanted to present to you various therapeutic possibilities that various studies have presented. So my request to you is if possible, if you can have a paper and a pen because over the talk, talk's duration, there will be multiple points where I'll present some of the uh, drugs. So maybe I can take the notes afterwards and present them to you, but if you can write them down as well, that will be great too. The basic structure of the talk today, I did a couple of Zoom talks with patrons or paid members yesterday, and we went long, I think one and a half hour or more than an hour. I'm going to try to stay within half an hour today. However, if you would like to see the mechanism of Epstein-Barr viruses antibody productions or antigen and then antibody productions, tell me, I will do one more lecture after this one just to break this one into two parts. So let's start. Uh, have your paper and pens ready. And I think it's, it's going to be an interesting and important talk. So these are the gifts for humanity. They're continuing. And let me first go over some of the references, especially this one reference and make some points here. So this is stressed, stress-induced Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. 2021, September. So in here, this study is not about long COVID, but what they're talking about is how stress of various kinds, including emotional stress, can reactivate Epstein-Barr virus. And I want to actually, so th this is a great, a uh, great paper, probably beyond the scope of half an hour's discussion, we can do a separate discussion, but there are some points I wanted to bring to you. So when Epstein-Barr virus is present in our body, remember the primary infection is when um, we kiss each other during the early age or whenever the first time, and if the other one has EBV, then we can catch that as well. And sometimes a primary infection is a mononucleosis, then the Epstein-Barr virus in 90% of us worldwide is present and it is sitting in B cells, immune cells, B cells. And not the whole virus, but the genetic material of the virus is sitting in there and is just at a very low basal level, keep some genes open and working, and then it can become reactivated and start making Epstein-Barr viruses, which would then cause an active infection. In some individuals, it can become chronic as well, where it just keeps making more viruses and it does that in more quicker windows of times every few months, and that causes a debilitating outcome. Otherwise, it, it never reactivates, or when it does reactivate, that is when we have a um, stressor on our body, emotional or infection or, or other immune-related stressors. So there are types of latencies. Latencies simply mean the Epstein-Barr virus sitting in us and just uh, being there. Here is something I wanted to share, the first point. <clears throat> As the Epstein-Barr virus sits in a B cell, it can immortalize the B cell, meaning it can tell the B cell not to die away. Just like, remember Dr. Bruce Patterson's discussion of the monocyte with the S1, which become immortalized and just keep staying active and keep making inflammatory mediators and cause inflammation. Similarly, Epstein-Barr virus can also cause B cells to become immortal and continue to live for long, hosting the virus in them. The question that how does 
a B cell become immortal under the influence of Epstein-Barr virus is very interesting. So here is the answer to that one. The Epstein-Barr virus has been shown to stimulate reactive oxygen species production in cells. So I hope that you have your paper and pen ready with you. This is the first area of uh, interest in terms of therapeutics. So what they're saying is that Epstein-Barr virus produces a lot of reactive oxygen species. Those reactive oxygen species in turn cause various genes in the immune cell to open up which cause the immune cell to start functioning. And I have mentioned this before as well, that when an immune system cell is working, then the remaining system cells do not bother that. Plus, when a cell is working, that cell turns off its own apoptotic mechanisms or its own death mechanisms. It doesn't die. It becomes active. So Epstein-Barr virus sits down inside and makes reactive oxygen species that cause the, the cell to become bothered and become active which causes the cell to become immortal. So, of course, it is not as simple uh, as I'm saying. There are particular genes that become modulated and there are studies that show those mechanisms. What I want to establish here, your first thing to write down, neutralizing reactive oxygen species helps reduce the Epstein-Barr virus load. So, for example, in fact, Chen Kamrana, Kamranwar and Masuchi showed that the addition of reactive oxygen species scavengers, and I have discussed that in the past as well, that N-acetylcysteine, for example, or glutathions, scavengers such as N-acetylcysteine amide and reduced glut glutathione to infected B cells significantly inhibited their proliferation. <coughs> So if we have Epstein-Barr virus, then the first thing that we must do is to make sure that our reactive oxygen species production is controlled. And a couple of controllers, we know vitamin C does that. We also know NAC does that. We also know reduced glutathione does that. So that is one. Then the authors further found that reactive oxygen species production was necessary for normal expression of LMP1 and ROS scavengers decreased signal transducers and activation of transcript transcription phosphorylation. What they're saying here is the mechanism of reactive oxygen species. So if you go back up here in this diagram, these are various uh, genetic, the various genes of the Epstein-Barr virus. And if you see here, LMP1 is present as well. These genes, when they become activated, they help the Epstein-Barr virus work on the B cell and stay mortal and, and stay latent. So here, these reactive oxygen species work by, um, sorry, the scavengers that reduce the reactive oxygen species, they work by affecting these genes. So that is the first thing that can go on your notepad, that reactive oxygen species reducers, that will be vitamin C, that will be um, glutathione, reduced glutathione, that will be NAC. Okay, now if I continue. It's a long <laughs> paper and it's a beautifully written paper. They have done some hard work over here. Then the co-infection and immunosuppression and reactivation. So here in this section 4.2, they talk about what are the possible ways that the re reactivation can occur. And of course, the point of looking at these is for you to connect the dots that it is possible that if you have long COVID or the vaccine injury and you go through a specific kind of a stressor, then you should be aware that EBV can be reactivated. So they said that we observed that in post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. So when somebody has transplantation, tissue transplant, and the lymphocytes or the the blood, uh, the immune cells, they become more in number, they proliferate, they increase in number. During that time, EBV can become proliferated as well. So anytime the cells will increase in number, which will mean an infection, a viral or bacterial infection, autoimmune disorders, anytime the cells are asked, the immune cells are asked to duplicate and increase in number, the Epstein-Barr virus would get a chance to duplicate as well and get, get a chance to become active. Then check this out. Myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, is another disease associated with EBV reactivation. 
Symptoms include poor concentration, sleep disturbance, tender lymphadenopathy, musculoskeletal pains, etc. So these symptoms of these disease actually are associated with EBV. Now, what we do not know is, can EBV cause these symptoms or do these pathologies activate the EBV? And there is a combination of both. However, we know that individually, Epstein-Barr viruses activation, reactivation, can actually cause fatigue and neurological symptoms just like we see in the long COVID and MECFS. Then here, EBV can act as an opportunistic virus capable of taking advantage of host co-infection to reactivate. For example, a recent study assesses EBV reactivation in the setting of cytomegalovirus. So they saw that somebody who got cytomegalovirus, they had 52.7% of the patients also got EBV reactivation. So I would generalize it to say that when there are other viral infections, they can lead to EBV reactivation. And I would show you later on in today's talk that you would see that with the SARS-CoV-2, there were majority of the patients in, a, uh, in acute or long COVID had the EBV reactivation. Then the reactivation, for example, was not only seen in acute COVID, so they have a COVID section. A separate study used EBV antibody titers to document EBV reactivation in 20 of 30 patients, and I'll, I'll present that study today, still experiencing COVID-related symptoms, including brain fog, fatigue, arthralgias, headache, and other besides at least 30 days for diagnosis. And, and, and the, in this study, I, I'll present it today, the authors actually suggested that these um, symptoms may have been something to do with the uh, EBV. And this is why I wanted you to have your notepad because if you go to a doctor and you say, I have EBV reactivation, most of the time, <coughs> excuse me, most of the time the, uh, the, there is actually no standard license approved therapy for EBV. So sometimes they administer steroids. Sometimes they have, for example, uh, monolurin or other possibilities, but there is no direct therapy. And this is why I would request you to pick up these therapies that are over here. So this is one more that the COVID can cause reactivation as well. And the symptoms look very much similar to long COVID. Then other cellular stresses. For example, integrated stress response is a common cellular response to stressors that involve phosphorylating and eukaryotic translation. So there are some kinds of stressors that would cause various enzymes within a cell to become activated and start protecting itself. And those stressors can actually cause EBV reactivation as well. Then radiation can reactivate the um, EBV. Then psychological stressors. And they have actually gone through the studies over here to discuss them. Stress is closely related to pain. Thus, it is unsurprising that an association has been found between pain and EBV reactivation. Participants in a study assessing the relationship between pain and EBV reactivation found that older adults who reported more pain had increased antibody titers, meaning increased number of uh, viruses present in them. Then gender. There was an increase in EBV shedding in the female subpopulation. And then they continue on. Now, I mentioned reactive oxygen species scavengers. Some more potential therapies that this paper has put together. One is the tenofovir, disoproxyl fumarate or TDF, and tenofovir alafenamide which are metabolized to the acyclic nucleoside nucleotide analog tenofovir in treating EBV reactivation. So if you have your pen and paper tenofovir or TDF and TAF, uh, some of these are actually experimental. So just be aware. For example, this next one is an experimental one. So dipyridomol is another drug that has been evaluated for EBV therapeutics. Then proton pump inhibitors for the, uh, for the acidity in our stomachs. Proton pump inhibitors are best known for their role in treating gastroesophageal reflux disease. Recent literature has suggested that they may have antiviral capabilities as well. 
So then they talk about the vaccines and what is being done. But this is what I wanted to put in front of you. The um, link to this paper or manuscript is present in the description of this video. So this is one. Now I'm going to quickly show. And interestingly, today I did not talk about Dr. Bean. If you would like to have access to these kind of lectures, buy access to drbean.com. There is a link in the description for that. So I'm just going to very quickly show you these um, studies. And then I'm going to present these through my um, PowerPoint. So I'm going to close this window and then go to my PowerPoint. <clears throat> so the talk is now starting. Actually, the previous part was also very important from a therapeutic point of view. So long COVID prevalence. The prevalence, the way I want to present this to you is, first I want to present that what is the long COVID prevalence? How many people who get COVID will become long COVID or have a incidence of long COVID? Vaccine injury, as much as it is a reality, unfortunately, there are so fewer few studies to actually talk about the prevalence. So that is an area where I can't say how many people out of how many got the vaccine. So secondly, these studies that I'm going to present to you are for long COVID. Although I believe, so this is my part, I believe that because the pathogenesis, the reason for the pathology is very similar, spike protein and spike protein, although the virus does more things too, that may cause an overlap in the pathogenesis, which would mean that these studies can be applicable to vaccine injury as well. Although these studies do not explicitly do that, I am connecting that dot. So I want to tell you so that you can discard it and say, okay, I don't believe it because Mubin said it and not the study. And that will be fair. So long COVID prevalence. The prevalence and long-term health effects of long COVID among hospitalized and non-hospitalized population is systemic review. So this is a meta-analysis. So what they did was they picked up other studies and saw what was the uh, prevalence of long COVID. What I want to present to you is prevalence of long COVID. Then in the long COVID patients, once we know that out of 100, how many become long COVID, then within the long COVID patients, how many have EBV reactivation? And then what is the therapeutic possibility? So here, 194 studies, totaling 735,006 participants were included. What they found was that fatigue was frequently reported across hospitalized, 28.49, non-hospitalized, 34.8, and mixed, 25. Amongst the hospitalized cohort, abnormal CT, pattern, X-ray, were frequently reported, 45%, alongside ground glass appearance, opacification, 41%, and impaired diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, 31%. Interpretation. Our work shows that 45, so in this one, 45% of the COVID survivors, regardless of hospitalization status, were experiencing a range of unresolved symptoms at four months. So according to this meta-analysis, that is analysis of 194 studies, they think 45% of the patients have long COVID. In the past, I have shown the incidence from various studies. For example, there have been studies from China that showed anywhere about 30% or more. There have been studies from the US that showed, for example, the Veterans Affairs Hospital that showed 7% or so. Then there have been studies that showed long COVID and uh, prior vaccination and then the breakthrough from the vaccination infection and then the long COVID. So there are all kinds of studies out there with their prevalences or incidence measurement. My approach is that I consider anywhere from 20 to 30% of the individuals become long COVID. This is another study for the long COVID prevalence. This is 2021 June investigating investigation of long COVID prevalence and its relationship to Epstein-Barr virus reactivation. So in this study, it has been reported that about 30% of the coronavirus disease patient experience long COVID. So they have 
taken 30% number. I just mentioned it, that there is a range. Now, Epstein-Barr virus itself. So I've, I have now talked about that long COVID happens and what is the incidence of that. Now, EBV reactivation. Same study. Epstein-Barr virus is a human gamma herpes virus. It is known to have infected and generally become latent more than 90% of global population. So the second piece of information I want to put in front of you is we have 90% of us have EBV in us. 95% of healthy adults have EBV in them. EBV sometimes causes chronic infections or serially reactivated infections in which it can efficiently infect both epithelial cells and B cells. EBV can also switch between lytic and latent phases. And this is the part which I said earlier. If you would like, I can do a separate talk today to talk about the phases and the genetics of EBV and the antigens and antibodies. However, my purpose of this talk is to present to you what are the possibilities, how many people can be EBV, and then what are the labs and what are the possible therapeutics. A variety of clinical manifestations have been associated with EBV reactivation. These include fatigue, psychoneurosis, brain fog, sleep disturbance, arthralgia, pharyngitis, myalgia, headaches, fever, GIT complaints, and various skin rashes. This is a very important piece. If out of all of this study, if you just noted down what are the possible therapeutics, and if you just considered this one statement, then my purpose for today's talk is done. What I'm saying here is long COVID and vaccine injury both have the these symptoms fatigue psycho neuro neurosis brain fog sleep disturbance you would see that a majority of long covid patients have ebv reactivation and here you're reading that e ebv itself causes these symptoms so that means that in long covid patient some of the patients who where reactivation is present they may have just the EBV symptoms mixed with the long COVID or long COVID symptoms which are of the same type plus EBV superimposed or just the long COVID and EBV not doing much, but EBV can be a contributory part in there. This also means that when we keep looking for spike-related pathology, while there may be EBV reactivation, then we are looking in the wrong direction. So the directions I have been evolving over the previous two, three years to understand what are the pathogenesis and what are the main possibilities. So we know that there can be spike-related issues. There is spike-related endothelial damage. There can be spike-related inflammation. There can be spike-related monocyte-type um, issues that we have discussed in the past. Then... I hope that I have been presenting in the last few weeks, months, that anti-idiotypical antibodies or the Neil Jenkins network theory of the homeostatic mechanism for antibody management is also an important concept. And anti-ACE2 antibodies are important to keep an eye on because they would behave like the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, but they are not the spike protein. And they are actually more dangerous than the spike protein because not only they can bind with ACE2, they also have an antibody structure. That means they can do the remaining biological functions of antibody. That means they can activate complement system. That means they can connect with the mast cells. That means they can sit down with the, with the neutrophils. That means they can work with the macrophages and they can opsonize various tissues antibody behaving like a spike protein is more dangerous than the spike protein and i see that physicians do not have a focus on that because we have just focused so much on this spike protein all of us including me so two the third focus I had done this series in the past and I hope that I presented my case, but it seems like I have not. So here is the third part that we should look at, and that is latent virus reactivations, which includes 
ای بی وی ریئیکٹیویشن ہیومن ہرپی سکس وائرس ریئیکٹیویشن سائٹو میگلو وائرس ریئیکٹیویشن اینڈ فلیئر اپ آف ایچ آئی وی اینڈ ایپسٹین بار وائرس ریئیکٹیویشن از ویری سملر ان اٹ سمٹمس ٹو لانگ کووڈ سو دس از آئی ہوپ is an important one that is in front of us. A variety of clinical manifestations have been associated with EBV reactivation. These include fatigue, which is a hallmark of the long COVID. I presented it to you, the biggest, um, most prevalent symptom. Psychoneurosis, brain fog, sleep disturbance, arthralgia, joint pains, pharyngitis, the inflammation in the um, throat, myalgia, muscle pains, headaches, fever, GIT complaints, and skin rashes. They are EBV as well. Okay, so I'm going to move from here now. EBV reactivation is most commonly identified in clinical practices using serological testing. Early, so there are, these are the antigens. When I was discussing this with patrons yesterday, I was actually going through these, uh, these diagrams. to explain how these work. But if I did that today, it would really become a long lecture. So if you are interested in seeing that, <coughs> please just tell me and I would finish this lecture and come back and discuss that as well separately. So these are over here, what they're saying is that EBV reactivation has certain serology through which we can find it out. And I want to put one more thing over here in front of you. This is also something that can go on your notepad. And that is EBV serology can be done and it may come back negative while the activation is still present. And I'll show you that study today. I have discussed that study in, in detail in the past. The reason for that is in that other study that, that is down the road on this paper is that they think that because herpes viruses live mostly in the oral areas and SARS-CoV-2 arrives in the oral nasopharyngeal area as well, so the act- reactivation starts from the oral area, which means that the local lymph nodes start reacting first and local B cells start making antibodies. So these are better found in saliva than blood plasma. So a patient who might become long COVID or a patient who might develop long COVID symptoms may not have an indicator in plasma, but may have those indicators in saliva. Now, the, there is a problem. If you go to a lab and say, I want to see the EBV antibodies in saliva, they would not have any test. The, these tests are present for research, but not for, uh, for commercial purposes. The commercial purposes, saliva test for EBV is the DNA test. Still, if you can get that for the reactivation, that will be useful. The other important thing is that sometimes antibodies are not detectable. However, the downy cells are, the downy cells are activated cytotoxic T cells. So when the EBV becomes reactive and the B cells are sick, then the cytotoxic T cells, they become active and they go and kill these B cells. those cytotoxic T cells would start circulating in the blood and these can be identified as, and they're called Downy cells because Downy was the, the researcher who found them. So they are actually really activated T cells. I was talking with Dr. Keith Berkowitz today and he said that, Mubin, do you know that nowadays uh, I also get T cell profile for the patients because I see that many cytotoxic T cells become activated So that was very interesting. I did not bait him to talk about this. He was, we were just discussing how is he practicing. And he, he is already looking at the T-cell profile. So this may be another profile that if you are uh, suffering with long COVID or vaccine injury, that may be useful to do in addition to the EBV serology. So that means now three types of tests. Serology is a standard test. The monospot test, isn't that interesting, heterophile antibodies, but still can be done. Serology can be done. If saliva samples can be done, that is great. Otherwise, saliva, saliva DNA is fine as well. And then blood samples with the activated T cells, 
cytotoxic T cell is very important as well. Continuing, now here is another piece of information that I want to bring to you. It is a small study, but look at this. We found that 66.7%, 20 out of 30, long-term long COVID subjects versus 10%, 2 out of 20 of long-term control subjects were positive for EBV. So there were 20 people who were controlled and there were 30 people who were long COVID. And they saw that the 30 patients who were long COVID, 66.7% of them had EBV reactivation. And only 10% of normal uh, other healthy population that was acting as control had re EBV reactivation. This is a huge thing. 66.7% patients of long COVID may have EBV reactivation. The, so I would request you, so the numbers out of 100 COVID patients, anywhere from 10 to 30% long COVID, out of these 100 long COVID, 66.7% may have EBV reactivation. This is how large this number is. Then here, this is the short-term long COVID, meaning long COVID started but just started. So we found that 66.7, 6 out of 9 of short-term long COVID subjects showed evidence of EBV reactivation based on positive titers. Of course, then there would be a question in your mind that will the actual COVID acute infection have EBV reactivation as well? And I'll show you that. So now you're seeing three phases of the, of the disease. Acute disease that I'll present in a short while. Short-term long COVID, meaning a few months only. Long-term long COVID, many months in the long COVID. So short-term long COVID, 66.7. Long-term long COVID, 66.7. Now let's look at acute disease. Okay, so before I go there, the symptoms of EBV and this chart looks like an eye chart, so don't worry about it. It's fatigue, insomnia, headache. We just talked about the myalgia, arthralgias in those. These are EBV symptoms. Then here, Chen A. All of Remnin Hospital at Wuhan University in Hubei, China, were the first to document finding EBV reactivation in COVID-19 patients. So now the third thing I'm presenting to you, acute disease and in that disease reactivation of EBV. They found that 52.2% of the hospitalized patients had the EBV reactivation, 52, half of them. Then check this one out. This is an Italian study. In this study, they said that we have observed 95.2% of the patients in ICU had the reactivation and 83.6% had sub-ICU just before the ICU had the reactivation. So acute COVID, 51%. Sub-acute meaning sub-ICU uh, and ICU, more than 80% reactivation. So what it means is that this virus, EBV, combines hands with SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2 possibly ends up reactivating it by putting stress on our body. And then both of them cause damage to us. Here is another study. Lenar Aol ran EBV and cytomegalovirus DNA test on COVID-19 patients in the medical ICU at the University of Innsbruck, Austria, and found that 78% of the COVID-19 patients they tested with respiratory failure requiring invasive ventilation had EBV, EBV reactivation. 78%. So then in the same study, they talk about the management approach. So they say that extended administration, so there are three that they would have here. So again, if you have your paper and pen with you, the three are valcyclovir, genicyclovir, or gencyclovir, and spironolactones. So here, extended administration of valcyclovir, 
is known to reduce the frequency of EBV infected B cells and has been theorized as a treatment to eradicate EBV from the body. Then spironolactone has been found in vitro to inhibit, this is an in vitro therapy, EBV VCA synthesis and capsid formation. And then this study showed that the treatment with Jan cyclovir an anti-herpivirus drug that blocks the replication of EBV reduce the risk of death in patients with severe disease. So how many things now we know? Well, I want to continue to stress on the therapeutic side because that is a, the takeaway at the end of the day. So reactive oxygen species neutralizers or scavengers, vitamin C, um, what was that, glutathione, reduced glutathione, NSE. Then we talked about other drugs over there as well that could help. And now we are looking at some antivirals over here. Spironolactone is interesting. It is not really an antivirus, but it helps. Now, acute COVID. Here is another study about the acute COVID. I just presented it some data to you before as well. This is interesting, this study, because what they're saying is that when acute COVID had EBV combined with it, then the patients had more fever. And I'll tell you my own point of view that whenever somebody said that, hey, I have SARS-CoV-2, and then they also had higher fever, I would think it is bacterial infection, superimposed secondary infection. And so antibacterial are needed. Here in this study, they said that actually if EBV is combined with SARS-CoV-2, then the patient's fever is higher. So that means if the patient is trending above 100, but not 103, 104, and it is kind of not, anti, uh, and you know, the viral infection like fever is not exactly low grade, but it is exactly not high grade, that may be EBV reactivation as well. So that is one thing they found. The second thing they found was that when EBV was superimposed with SARS-CoV-2, then the C-reactive protein that is produced by the liver in the acute phase of the disease, meaning whenever our body is under stress by an infection or inflammation, we ask our liver to make more acute phase proteins and C-reactive protein is one such protein and that is a, um, <clears throat> an indicator of acute inflammation going on. So C-reactive protein was more in EBV plus SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that actually makes sense. There are now two pathogens that are attacking our body. So of course, our body is going to respond more fiercely and would produce more C-reactive protein. At the same time, if you see here, the aspartate aminotransferase or AST was also increased. So the liver was under stress as well. So those patients that had EBV plus SARS-CoV-2, their liver damage was occurring as well, compared to those who only had SARS-CoV-2 and not EBV. And finally, they saw that those patients that were co-infected with EBV and SARS-CoV-2, they had a higher use of corticosteroid. That means they were more in severe. And doctors were using steroids with them. So that means... EBV can actually also cause tipping of the patient towards more severe state. So once again, I'll tie it back. You, you would probably hate me for re repeating it so many times. That means reactive oxygen species scavengers, vitamin Cs and glutathions and uh, what was that, NSC, they must be used during acute illness and during long COVID, even vaccine injury because they are very important to keep EBV in control. So EBV reactivation may be associated with severity of COVID-19. Then next one. This is a study that I've discussed in um, complete lecture. And this is the antibody fingerprint of latent virus reactivations in SARS-CoV-2 long COVID through saliva. So here, if you see, they said at three to six months after the mild asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection, virus-specific antibodies in saliva were substantially induced, signifying a strong reactivation of later viruses, for example, ZBVs, herpeviruses, in both cohorts. In patients with ME-CFS, anti -res antibody responses were significantly stronger. So those patients who had ME-CFS-like symptoms 
they actually have higher titers of antibodies. That means they had more reactivation. So that means reactivation can cause these things, can contribute towards these things, not cause them. In particular, EBV encoded nuclear antigen 1 were IgG were elevated in patients with MECFS, but not in healthy donors or healthy whatever patients. EBV VCA IgG, which is also another sero serology for it, was also elevated at baseline prior to SARS-CoV-2 infection in patients compared to HDs. Now, somebody who had EBV already active, they could also have more fingerprint or the antibodies present. Then they say our results denote an altered and chronically aroused antiviral profile against latent viruses in MECFS. SARS-CoV-2 infection, even in its mild asymptomatic form, is a potent trigger for reactivation of latent viruses. And that can be seen in saliva, even before seen in blood. Uh, this is MECFS, myeloencephalitis chronic fatigue syndrome, very similar to long COVID sy symptoms of neurological uh, symptoms and the uh, fatigue. This has not been shown before because the antibody elevation is not detected systematically in uh, systemically in circulating plasma. This is very, very important. And why do I keep harping on this? MECFS is a disease that we doctors have for a long time just put that in a bucket of we don't know what's going on we cannot fix it and these patients suffer for long time for whole lives of theirs many long covid or vaccine injured patients present with the similar symptoms and doctors can easily put them in mecfs category and say done mecfs but they may actually have spike damage or they may have the anti-ACE2 antibodies or they may have EBV reactivation and these are manageable situations. EBV is not as manageable, but still it, it goes up and down and there are some therapeutics that we talk about. And this is why you actually see that many long COVID patients start improving on their own as well. And that may be because EB, EBV got reactivated and then it became silent. Or that may be that immune system became disturbed and then it became silent. So it's not necessary that every long COVID patient is MECFS. This is what I want to present. Okay, next. EBV reactivation and long COVID symptoms. So this is another study we observed. Sorry for this really small eye chart, but I'm going to read it for you. We observed that long COVID symptoms such as fatigue and neurocognitive dysfunction at a median of four months following initial diagnosis were independently associated with serological evidence suggestive, suggesting recent EBV reactivation. This is very important. That fatigue and neurological dysfunction within four months of SARS-CoV-2 was strongly associated with EBV reactivation. And then here are the references. These references are in the um, in the description as well. Final question for you. If you would like me to discuss this, I've, these, as you can see, these are my drawings from my previous lecture. So those lectures are present. So either you can watch those lectures or if you like, I can go over this very quickly once more, but I'll do a separate lecture so that this lecture doesn't become too long, although it is already 44 minutes. So let me know in the comments that would you like me to come back online in a few minutes and do the second lecture. So with this, thank you very much for watching. I hope that there are some important things that you can infer from this lecture. Look at these studies, especially the very first paper, and then help yourself, help others. If you're a physician, please keep in mind three things, vaccine injury, anti-ACE2 antibodies, and latent virus reactivations. So with this, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe and share. There are description, there are links in the description of this video. You can support this work. And I wanted to share with you for the first time a um, 
cool bean i would ask her if she would like me to disclose her name has invested forty thousand dollars in dr bean for producing diabetes lecture series dr bean's lecture we produce at in about one to two thousand dollars I, I come here every day for a free lecture, but uh, when we produce them with proper editing and with the teacher who presents it, we have the teacher fees and the editor's fees, and then people write questions and the, and the descriptions and they prom- publish it. And they, so there is a bunch of things <coughs> that happen. And depending upon the length of the lecture, it could be 1,000 to 2,000. So uh, she was generous enough to invest 40,000 for us to produce diabetes lectures. If you would like us to produce some lectures, please tell me you can invest as well. But that uh, for me, that was a, uh, a pleasant surprise. So with this, thank you very much. If you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can use PayPal or you can become a member of Substack or Patreon, etc. So thank you very much. I look in the, uh, messages for a few more minutes to see if you would like me to come back and talk about the EBV and its serology. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.